And now, Thriller Thursdays on the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance recommended. The Mysteries of Dr. John Thorndike by R. Austin Freeman. Thorndike is the original fictional forensic detective from the early 1900s, using science to aid the art of detection to bring criminals to justice. This time presenting The Blue Sequin, adapted for radio by Heather Elliott. This is very unfortunate, Jervis. Very unfortunate indeed. All aboard for Halberry Junction! We can't wait any longer, Thorndike. Yeah, very well. I'm afraid we have missed our friend. Oh, perhaps that is him. Hmm? A-, a gentleman just made the train by the skin of his teeth. I would think that if Mr. Edward Stoppard was in such a hurry to meet with us, he might at least arrive at the train on time. Oh, I'm sure Mr. Stoppard has a very good reason. His telegram was quite explicit. Here, let me read it to you again. Can you come here tomorrow to direct defense? Important case. All costs undertaken by us, Stopford and Myers. Yes, but his next telegram said he was leaving for Waldhurst by the 825 from Charing Cross, and that he'd call if he could. He didn't call, and we have no idea if he's even on the train. It's most unfortunate, for it deprives us of our invaluable preliminary considerations of the case. Must you always talk like a lawyer, Thorndike? I thought you don't like reading newspapers. I only read articles worth my time. It's a great disadvantage to come straight into a case without any preparation, to be confronted with the details before one has the chance of considering the case in general terms. For instance, take this. Such as what, Thorndike? I do believe this is our case, Jervis. Take a look at the article at the top of the page. Terrible murder in Kent. Well, of course it would be a murder we're called in to investigate. Just read the article. Uh, shocking crime discovered yesterday morning at the little town of Waldhurst. Discovery made by a porter. Inspecting the carriages of the train which had just come in. First class compartment. Horrified to find the body of a fashionably dressed woman stretched out on the floor. Uh, keep reading, Jervis. Medical aid was immediately summoned. Divisional surgeon Dr. Morton reported that the woman had not been dead for more than a few minutes. Interesting. You see here, the state of the corpse leaves no doubt that a murder of the most brutal kind has been committed, the cause of death being a penetrating wound of the head inflicted with some pointed implement. The force of it went right through the skull into the brain. Robbery not the motive. Expensive dressing bags still there. Jewelry, too, including several valuable diamond rings. It's rumored an arrest has been made by the local police. What do you think of it, Jervis? A gruesome affair for certain. But the newspaper report does not give much information. True, but it does give us some things to consider. The wound to the skull was caused by some pointed implement, assuming it wasn't a bullet wound. Now, what kind of object could make that wound? And how would it be used in the confined space of the railway car? Ah, and what sort of person would have such an implement? Not to mention possible motive, excluding robbery, of course, and any other circumstances other than murder which might account for the injury. The choice of suitable implements isn't very great. Uh, True, and most of them are associated with certain specific occupations, such as uh, a plasterer's pick or a geological hammer. You have a notebook, I presume? Of course. Well, then stop chattering away and write down everything you can think of. Albury Junction! All off for connecting line to Waldhurst. There's so many people here. I wish we knew what Mr. Stopford looked like. Look, there's a man coming toward us in quite a hurry. The same man who almost missed the train. Dr. Thorndike. Yes, and you are Mr. Edward Stopford, I presume? Pleased to meet you. Thank you for coming. I, I see you had the paper. Most shocking events. I'm immensely relieved to have met up with you. I nearly missed the train myself, and I worried I would miss you here, too. Well, there appears to have been an arrest yes, made. Yes, my brother. Our train doesn't start for another 15 minutes, so I have time to fill you in on what I know. Ah, please do. Why don't we leave our traveling cases in our train car and stretch our legs for a bit? Maybe stroll down the platform while we talk. Excellent suggestion. The murdered woman was Miss Edith Grant, 
formerly an artist model who had frequently been employed by my brother Harold some years ago. Harold Stopford, yes, I know his work very well, and charming work it is at that. Yes, in those days he was a youngster, about 20 years old, when he first met Miss Gray. He became quite close with her, nothing scandalous, but he, he wasn't very discreet with his interest either. She was a nice, respectable girl, and no one thought the flirting any harm. <laughs> one never does. However, a great many letters passed between them and some little presents, amongst which was a beaded chain carrying a locket. He was fool enough to put his own portrait in the inscription, Edith from Harold. I don't think that foolish. A bit sentimental, but certainly not foolish. Perhaps not, but things did not stay the way they were. Miss Gray had a rather good voice and went into comic opera, and her habits and associates changed in the meantime. My brother had become engaged and was anxious to get his letters back. Oh, the locket, too, I'm sure. Naturally. Miss Gray returned the letters, but refused to part with the locket. For the last month, my brother Harold has been staying in the village of Halbury to sketch the surrounding areas. So what happened between him and Miss Gray? Evidently, they must have met again recently. Yesterday, at the train platform. She was on her way to London, and he was going back to Woldhurst. They took a private first-class compartment for themselves. And what happened after that? Harold, my brother, said she was wearing the locket, and they argued over her returning it. Both a guard and a porter noticed they were having a heated discussion. Eventually, she snapped the chain and threw the locket at Harold. Hmm. How did he react to that? He didn't say, but they seemed to have parted on good terms. When he got off the train at Shinglehurst, Harold was going out to sketch, so he had with him his kit. He also had a large umbrella with an ash wood staff that was fitted with a powerful steel spike for driving into the ground. Ah, I see the impact to the skull. That's precisely what the police suspected. It was about half past ten when Harold left Shinglehurst and nearly eleven when he began his sketching. All aboard for Wolderst! Excuse me, but they're boarding the train now. Have a seat, gentlemen, please. To continue, Harold worked for three hours before returning to the train, where he was promptly arrested by the police. So he was seen to be quarreling with Miss Gray, and was the last to see her alive. That's a possible reason, and it appears he had an implement that could do the damage described in the paper. It is all circumstantial. Oh, of course it is, Mr. Stopford. We know that. The police found the broken lock and chain in Harold's pocket, and assumed he tore it from her neck himself. And what of his character? Perfect, if I may say so. He is the gentlest and most amiable man I know, and anything else from him would be imbecilic. As a lawyer, I can see that everything is hopelessly against him. I wouldn't say hopelessly, even though I do expect the police to be pretty sure of themselves. When does the inquest open? Today, at four. I have obtained an order from the coroner that allows you to examine the body and be present for the post-mortem examination. You wouldn't happen to know anything about the position of the wound or the body? I thought you would ask, so I was very particular with my questions to the police surgeon. The wound is a little above and behind the left ear, a horrible round hole with a ragged cut or tear running from it to the side of the forearm. I see, and how was the body laying? right along the floor, with the feet close to the door, on the opposite side of the platform. Were there any other wounds, Mr. Stopford? A long cut or bruise on the right cheek. The police surgeon called it a... a An abrasion or contusion, perhaps? A contusion, yes, that's the word. He thinks it was inflicted with a heavy, blunt object. I haven't heard of any other wounds or bruises. Did anyone enter the train yesterday at Shinglehurst? No one, since the stop at Halbury. Hmm... Dr. Thorndyke. Yes, Mr. Stafford. We're approaching the place where the murder was committed, based on the facts. There's a number of wood chips scattered about the tracks, and some of the ties look new. Have there been any railroad workers out here lately? They're working the line now. At least I saw some working near Woldhurst yesterday. Someone said they were burning a pile of wood chips. I saw the smoke when I came down. There's a third railroad track here. Is it some sort of siding, perhaps? Yes, they switch the tracks and send the freight trains and empty trucks onto it. And over there is the pile of burned chips. Still smoldering. Uh, I see. Oh, that empty cattle car is just blocking the view. There's, there's a whole line of cars just sitting there. We're nearly to Woldhurst. That passenger car up ahead, the one that's closed up and sealed, that's the one. 
We're expected, I see. Yes, the station master, a police inspector, and two porters are waiting. Well, hello, Mr. Stopford. I'm the station master here at Woldhurst, and uh, this is Dr. Thorndike. Uh, pleased to meet you, yes, and my colleague, Dr. Jervis. Mm. Can I help you with your luggage? Oh, no, thank you. We can manage. Could I perhaps see the inside of the carriage? Oh, the police have sealed it up. You would have to ask the inspector. Then I'll just wander down and have a look at the outside. That should be fine, sir. What other first-class passengers were there? None, sir. There was only one first-class coach, and the deceased was the only person in it. It's given us all a dreadful surprise, this has. Were you here when the train came in yesterday? I was on the platform watching the wood chips burning. What a blaze it was! I was just mentioning that we should have to move the cattle truck that was on the middle track. Hmm, why was that? Uh, the smoke and sparks were blowing across the breeze, and I thought it would frighten the poor beasts. Mr. Felton, he's the owner, he doesn't like his cattle handled roughly. Says it spoils the meat. No doubt he's right. Do you think it possible for any person to board or leave the train on the other side, away from the platform? Unobserved, of course. Could a man, for instance, enter a compartment by way of the tracks at one station and then drop off as the train slowed down at the next, without being seen? Hmm, I'm, I doubt it, but I wouldn't say it's impossible. No, oh, thank you. Oh, and there's one other question. You have a gang of men working on the line. Do they belong to the district? Not a single one. They're all strangers and pretty rough diamonds, some of them are. But I shouldn't say there was any harm in them. If you was suspecting of any of them being mixed up in this... I suspect no one, sir, but I want to get all the facts of the case right up front. Okay, naturally, sir. Now, do you remember by chance whether the opposite door of the compartment was closed and locked when the body was discovered? Closed, but not locked. Why, sir, did you think... Nothing, 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 nothing. The, the sealed compartment is the one, of course. Sirs, I think it would be best to wait here while he surveys the coach. What is he doing? I've known the man for years, and I haven't the faintest idea. He's examining the footboard on the side away from the platform. What do you suppose he's so intent on finding? A footprint, some dirt, a piece of fabric. Don't worry, sir. He knows what he's doing. Well, then I'm sure he can clear my brother, no matter how unorthodox he may seem at the time. Why, he's got his face nearly touching the car. What's that he's doing now? It appears that he's found something of interest on the footboard. What's he going to do with it now? Examine it later, I'm sure. Is that a toy he's got now? Oh, wait. He's blowing dust into the compartment. Hey! Dr. Thorndike is only looking for fingerprints or anything else we can't see. The powder he's blowing will stick to the natural oils from our skin, leaving a black mark that we can see with the naked eye. Uh, here we are, gentlemen. I've finished looking around for the time being. I say, is that one of the railway men who was working on the tracks in this area? Uh, yes, that's the foreman of the gang. No, I'll just step back and have a word with him. If you'll just walk on slowly. I'll be back in a moment. Well, he's quite abrupt. Sometimes. Did you have a nice chat with the railwayman? Yes, most pleasant fellow. Isn't that the police inspector up ahead? Uh, come to see uh, what you're after, I expect. Afternoon, inspector. Mr. Stopford, I'm surprised to see you down here. This is Dr. John Thorndike and his colleague, Dr. Jervis. Yes, I've heard astounding things about you, Doctor. Have you come down to meet them, then? Uh, meet them? No. I'm just here by mere chance. But would you like to see the weapon, I suppose? The umbrella spike. And yes, if I may. We're on our way to the mortuary now. Then you'll pass the police station on the way. If you care to look in, I'll walk up with you. I'll be here on the train platform if you need me for anything more. There you are. Sir, don't say we haven't given everything to the defense. There are all the effects of the accused, including the very weapon the deed was done with. Oh, come, come, Inspector. We mustn't be premature. I'll just take a look at that spike on the umbrella staff. I'll maybe take a few measurements as well. Dr. Jervis, would you care to look at the box of painting and sketching supplies belonging to the accused? Uh, go ahead, Jervis. I'll be done here in a moment. Please, Inspector. That would be helpful. There you are, Dr. Jervis. You're... Brother is a very orderly man, Mr. Stopford. Everything is clean and in its proper place. Those brushes ought to be washed before they stiffen. Yes, this is all very significant. I'm finished over here now, Inspector. May I see the canvas? It's just a sketch. That's just a sketch? This was only three hours of work, Mr. Stopford? It's really a marvelous achievement. My brother is a very rapid worker. 
Perhaps, but this is not only amazingly rapid, but has such a life and feeling to it. it it's simply amazing. Is that all, then, Dr. Thorndike? Uh, yes, Inspector. Thank you. We'll be on our way now. What did you make of his belongings, Thorndike? Uh, that sketch and the color box were very suggestive to me. Uh, they're both under lock and key now. Just like my brother. Oh. Dr. Thorndike and Dr. Thurvis, I think I'll wait outside with the mortuary keeper. I'm, I'm not up to this right now. Uh, very well, Mr. Stopford, very well. I don't blame the fellow. A corpse is a hard sight for anyone the first time. Uh, there's something unspeakably sad in these poor relics. The deceased woman's clothing? To me, they're more tragic. The jaunty hat and costly skirts, the little French shoes and open-work silk stockings. It just shows her harmless, womanly vanity and the joyous, carefree life snapped short in the twinkling of an eye. I've spent my life with breathing patients. I've never thought of it that way before. Ah, uh, but we must not give way to sentiment, Juris. There is another life threatened, and it's up to us to keep Harold Stopford alive. Where shall we start, then? Let me see your hat. Here, here you are. It's amazing how women can keep that shapeless mass of ribbons and feathers together and call it a hat. Not to mention the strange angle they wear it at. Could you hand me a little paper envelope, please? I'd like to take a closer look at these dark blue sequins. They're all falling off around this hole in the brim. That must have been where the wound was inflicted. Yes, it appears to have been worn tilted over on the left side, judging by the general shape and the position of the hole. Here's the envelope. I'll, I'll label this from the hat, and it will go in my pocket until I can examine it more closely. Have you finished looking through her belongings? Y yes, now we need to examine the corpse itself. I'll pull back the sheet from her face. Ah, oh, dear, a handsome girl, a dark-haired blonde. What a sin to have disfigured herself like this with that horrible peroxide. She seems to have applied this stuff to her hair about ten days ago. How can you tell? Well, there's about a quarter of an inch of dark hair at the roots. Now, what do you make of that wound on the cheek, Jervis? It looks as if she had struck some sharp angle in falling. Hmm, but the seats are all padded in the first-class train cars, so I don't see what she could have struck. Well, that's what I thought. Now, let's take a look at the other wound. Will you write down the description for me in my notebook? Certainly. A clean punch, circular hole in the skull, an inch behind and above margin of left ear. Left ear. Diameter. An inch and seven sixteenths. Start fracture of parietal bone. Membranes perforated and brain enter deeply. Perforated. Enter deeply. Go on. A ragged scalp wound extending forward to margin of left orbit. Fragments of gauze and sequins in edges of wound. Gauze and sequins. Anything else? No, that will do for the present. Dr. Morton will give us further details if we want them. Wait, wait, wait. Hand me my tweezers. There's a few loose hairs I'd like to examine. Here. Uh, thank you, my good man. Dr. Thorndike, were you able to find any evidence that could clear my brother? I wouldn't talk with him right now, Mr. Stopford. He's got that look in his eyes, and right now he's piecing together the facts in his mind. The post-mortem will take place at four. It's only now half past eleven. What would you like to do next, Dr. Thorndike? Oh, dear. What is it? Your reference to the post-mortem reminds me that I forgot to put the ox gall into my case. Ox gall? What are you going to do with... Never mind. Is it important? Very. The only place I can think of to get some would be the butcher's shop. There's just one off the road over there. Ah, so there is. Good morning, sir. Are you the owner of this butcher shop? Yes, I am. Felton's the name. Ah, pleased to meet you, sir. I'm Dr. Thorndike, and this is my colleague, Dr. Jervis. We're creating a defense for Mr. Stopford's brother, Harold Stopford, and it's very important that we get some ox gall. Would you happen to have some? Hmm, ox gall. No, sir, I haven't any just now, but I am having a beast killed this afternoon, and I can let you have some then. Hmm, in fact, since this is of such importance to you, I can have one killed at once. That's very kind of you, and it would greatly oblige me. Is the ox perfectly healthy? They're in splendid condition, sir. I picked them out of the herd myself. I'll take you to the pen behind the shop and you can pick out the one you'd like. You're really very good. I'll just run over to the chemist next door and get a suitable bottle to store it in. There's the oxen I have. Take your pick, good doctor. That 
pen hardly looks big enough for the three of them. It keeps them from moving around too much and causing trouble. Ah, my dear Felton, these are excellent creatures. What are you doing, Doctor? The state of the horns enables one to judge, to some extent, the health of the beast. <laughs> Lord bless you, sir. They haven't got no feeling in their horns. Else what good would their horns be to them? Your tapping doesn't seem to bother the second one either. He doesn't seem to like that. Uh, Jervis, hold this stick while I lean over the fence and examine this horn. The pen is too small for the ox to harm us. Of course. You don't think there's anything wrong with this ox, sir, I hope? Well, I can't say without further examination. It may be only the horn that's affected. If you'll have it sawn off close to the head and sent up to me at the hotel, I will look at it and let you know. Well, certainly. And to prevent any mistakes, I'll mark it and cover it up. Jervis, inside my parcel from the chemist shop is some tissue paper and a rolled bandage and a small bit of sealing wax. Here, Mr. Felton. Hold the bottle for the ox skull so that I can get the other things for Thorndyke. Uh, uh, Jervis, now hold the end of the bandage while I wrap it around the pointed half of the horn. Like this? Uh, very good. Now, drip some of that sealing wax across the edges to keep it from unwrapping. Ah, perfect. Ah, uh, thank you once again, Mr. Felton, for letting me select the ox. I'll saw the horn off and bring it up to the hotel myself with the ox skull. You'll have them in a half an hour. What is taking so long? I mean, what's taking Dr. Thorndyke so long to examine the horn? He's just being thorough. What else is there to look at? Is he examining the entire thing with a magnifying glass? I'm just as anxious as you are, but our worries and wanderings won't make him work any faster. If he's nothing else, John Thorndyke is thorough. As you can see, he's found something of interest on the tip of the horn. Jervis, come look at this. Take a look at this microscope slide. All right. Well, what is it? Multipolar nerve cells. Very shriveled, but unmistakable. Ah, now look at this other particle on the slide. What is that? It's cell tissue. Oh, come, come, what type? Without a doubt, it's from the brain. I entirely agree with you. And that being so, we may now say the case for the defense is practically complete. What? What in heaven's name do you mean? You haven't done anything yet. On the contrary, I have. I can now prove when and where and how Miss Grant met her death. Explain away, Dr. Thorndyke. I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. Well, now there are several things to consider. First, the position of the body shows that when Miss Grant fell, she was sitting, or more likely standing, close to the door of the train car. Next is this. What is it? That's a sequin off the girl's hat, isn't it? I saw you gather some when we were in the mortuary. Exactly. But I found this one, this single sequin, on the rear end of the offside of the footboard. That's the side of the train car that faces the track, and not the platform. Well, the fact that I found it outside shows that at one point, Miss Grant had put her head out the window on that side of the car. The next item of evidence I obtained by dusting the margins of the window with a light powder. I found there a greasy smudge three and a quarter inches long. Three and a quarter? That's the same length as a contusion on the right cheek of Miss Gray's face. <laughs> Precisely, Jervis. There were no other marks on her aside from the death blow to her head. The wound in the skull is behind and above the left ear, is roughly circular, and measures one inch and seven sixteenths deep at most. A ragged scalp wound runs from it towards the left eye, and this furnishes our next few facts. This is the left horn from the ox, and if you remember, it was highly sensitive when I was tapping on it earlier this morning. Uh, Mr. Stopford, please place the cut end to your ear and squeeze the horn. What? Oh, all right. Hey, what is that noise? Ah, uh, that is the sound of a fracture. The pieces are grating against each other when you put pressure along the horn. Now, Jervis, take a look at the tip of the horn. What do you see? There's several deep scratches running lengthwise. I'm assuming you've measured the length of them, Thorndyke. The diameter of the horn where the scratches end is one inch and seven sixteenths. Covering the scratches is a dry blood stain, Mr. Stopford, and at the extreme tip is a small mass of dried substance which Dr. Jervis and I have just examined with the microscope and are satisfied is brain tissue. Good God! Do you mean to say... Let's finish with the facts first, Mr. Stopford. Now, I found a piece of hair stuck to the horn in the blood stain. Through a magnifying glass, you can see that the hair is a golden color everywhere but near the roots where it is black. You mentioned this morning in the mortuary that the deceased dyed her hair platinum blonde with peroxide and that she was naturally dark-haired. This hair matches the one you took this morning? Down to the last sixty-fourth of an inch. And lastly, there's this. As you can see quite clearly, there is a blue sequin embedded in the dried blood on the horn. 
Ah, oh, I don't know what you're saying, and I'm sure you can explain it perfectly, but I feel as if a great weight was lifted off. Oh! It's really quite simple. Even with a few facts that we have before us, which are, by the way, only a selection of the evidence in our possession. Tell us your theory, Thorndike, and let's see if I've figured it out correctly. Well, my hypothesis is that Miss Grant was standing with her head out of the offside window watching the burning wood chips. Her wide hat, worn on the left side, hid from her view the cattle truck which she was approaching. Oh, dear. I think I know what you are concluding. One of the steers, like this one, thrust out his long horn through the bars. The point of that horn struck the deceased's head, driving her face violently against the corner of the window, and then, in disengaging, plowed its way through the scalp and suffered a fracture of its core from the violence of the wrench. This hypothesis is inherently probable. It fits all the facts, and those facts don't leave room for many other explanations. I don't know what to say to you, except you have saved my brother's life. And for that, for that, may God reward you. I can't thank you enough for taking my defense, Dr. Thorndike. Oh, no trouble, no trouble at all. After your rousing testimony yesterday, the coroner's jury reached the verdict of death by misadventure, and I was released from jail not even an hour ago. But tell me, how did you solve the mystery so quickly? Oh, it was really quite simple. After reading the newspaper account, I had six possible theories of the cause of death worked out, before we even reached the transfer platform where I met up with your very anxious brother. He had every right to be anxious. I would be if the same were to happen to him. Well, after that, it only remained for me to choose the method that best fitted the facts provided by the scene where the body was found and the body itself. And it was short work of that, too. Once I had seen the cattle truck, had picked up that sequin, had heard the description of the steers, and had seen the hat and the wounds, there was nothing left to do but fill in the details. And you never doubted my innocence. Not after I had seen your color box and your sketch, to say nothing of your umbrella spike. You're too tidy and careful. It was finding that blue sequin on the ox's horn that put all the pieces together. <laughs> The Mysteries of Dr. John Thorndike, written by R. Austin Freeman, adapted for radio by Heather Elliott. In the cast were Dave Johnson as Dr. John Thorndike, Roy Nessel as Jervis, R. O. Well Yukonis as Edward Stopford, Joseph McGuire as Station Master, Nathan McCoy as The Inspector, Lane Smith as Butcher Felton, Eduardo Glasser as Harold Stopford. I'm your announcer, Jason Lynn. Edited by J. Charles. Directed by Susan Herrick. Produced by Joseph C. McGuire. Recorded at KSVR Studios. This was a Radio Theater Project presentation.